Balloons, bazookas, boob, boobies, bosoms, boulders, cans, hooters, knockers, melons, honkers, jugs, rack, tatas, tits, torpedoes, guns, bust, doorknobs, coconuts, and our favorite one, the girls. Welcome to the All About Breastfeeding Show, where your host, Lori, highlights mothers just like yourself and goes beyond the surface questions and digs deep so they share not only their joys and happiness in their daily breastfeeding life, but also their pain and struggles and how they worked through them. Episode number 127. Welcome to All About Breastfeeding, the place where the girls hang out. I am your host, Lori Jalisenstadt, IBCLC, which stands for International Board Certified Lactation Consultant, and I help moms with breastfeeding. For some of my viewers who are fairly new and may not know that much about me, you can always go to allaboutbreastfeeding.biz to learn much more about me. And for everyone who has not seen my new webpage yet, you can also go to allaboutbreastfeeding.biz and check out the services that I provide. I offer home visits and office visits for help with breastfeeding for moms who are local in Phoenix. For moms who are not local and don't have access to help, we can always do a Skype consult. For moms who are local or not, and you have questions before your baby's born, we can also do a Skype consult. So I work with a lot of moms who have questions before their baby's born. They may have had some kind of breast surgery or they're taking medication and don't know if that's safe for breastfeeding. Perhaps you have some other health issues that you want to talk about. Some moms have interesting breast and nipple anatomy that they're concerned how that's going to impact with their breastfeeding. Some moms, they just don't have a supportive partner or other family members around who they feel are knowledgeable enough or going to be helpful and they just want to talk it out. And I've also worked with quite a few moms who have a lot of anxiety about breastfeeding. Some it's because they had a previous breastfeeding experience that did not go well. And talking about it really helps them. And I can give you tips on how to help prepare you for the next breastfeeding experience. You will also see on this page that I have information about how to join our online breastfeeding mothers group, where you get to hang out on a Google Hangout with eight to 10 other moms and meet weekly for eight weeks and talk about all things related to breastfeeding. We socialize, you get to know other moms and For most mothers, they say they just feel really good having been a member of the group. It kind of gets them away from their day-to-day mommy baby stuff and get to talk to other moms who are doing the new mommy breastfeeding thing. You will also see there's information about the podcast and a whole archive of all the podcasts I've done. And there's also a resource library where there's lots of handouts and checklists on topics related to breastfeeding. So feel free to go to that page, allaboutbreastfeeding.biz and check out what we have to offer. Today's show, which is episode number 127, is actually a continuation of episode number 118. I did take a few weeks break from the usual Wednesday show where I had been talking about infant feeding practices And I just talked about some things that I felt were related to the holiday times that were beneficial to everyone. So feel free to go back to listen to 118 if you haven't listened to it yet. As we learned in one of the last shows, wet nursing drastically declined near the end of the 19th century. It never disappeared though. And as a matter of fact, in the early years of the 20th century, wet nurses could be seen and they were employed by hospitals. If a mom could not breastfeed her baby, then a wet nurse hired by the hospital fed her baby. With all this talk about the decline in wet nurses, it is important to remember that before artificial baby milk was popular, most mothers were still breastfeeding 
their own babies, and did so until they were at least two years old and many up until four. You may remember that I interviewed Jennifer Grayson a few shows ago, and she wrote the fabulous book called Unlatched, which I highly recommend. She reminds us that any attempts to replace human milk or replicate it proved overwhelmingly fatal. Her research supports what I have learned from my readings. When babies were given other animal milk, there was a high infant death rate. When they were given pap, a food made with flour and water, there was also a very high infant death rate. There are many accounts of tombs in Egyptian times and archaeologist finds that show vessels that are believed to be various forms of feeding instruments from thousands of years ago that were constructed of pottery. They were often found alongside skeletons of infants who obviously did not make it past the first few years of their life. The food infants were given were poor nourishment that they could not survive on, and the feeding instruments that were used were these vessels that were often contaminated. These poor babies just could not survive the bacteria they were exposed to. And when babies were not wet nursed, they died a very early death. And if you dig deep enough into the literature, you will find that there were places and times where some babies seemed to fare better. This typically happened in colder climates where it's believed that the bacteria was slower to take hold and contamination of feeding bottles was less of a concern. But even this was still far from optimal as a good 50% of the babies still died during infancy. Where there are records of babies being fed animal milk, there was death. I was reading in Unlatched about some hospitals. What they did was they trained goats to straddle the cribs so that babies could suckle their milk. According to the research, as high as 75% of the babies never made it to their first birthday. In Ireland, the Dublin Founding Hospital dealt with its epidemic of abandoned babies and shortages of wet nurses by feeding babies a mixture of pap and bread and water with a little animal milk. And according to the research, this was mixed with a strong opiate. The mortality rate was 99.6%. You know, it really makes me cry now to even think about this. Opiates? Uh, It was clear then, as it is now, human babies need human milk for optimal health, growth, development, and survival. This tells us that animal milk, whether it be cows or goats, is just not a good fit for human babies. Their milk is especially designed for their young, and they will thrive on it because it's exactly what they need. When human babies are given straight cow's milk, they also will not do well as the cow's milk is not a complete food for human infants. Without their mother's milk, the precious infants were defenseless without the protection that the immunological components of their own mother's milk gave them. Over the years, many experiments were done and many different formulas were made until they found enough of the right ingredients in the right amounts so that infants could survive their first six months to a year. The formulas we have now, well, they are exactly that, formulas, which are far from perfect food for our babies, which is why the formula companies continue to experiment, change the ingredients, add new ones, and each year come up with new and improved formulas. I worked in a large hospital for eight years and I had firsthand knowledge of exactly what would happen with the formula companies. They pretty much had the run of the maternity unit. Their representatives would come in with their cases of formula and stack them on the shelves. The representatives would bring in a full lunch for the staff and while the staff ate their lunch, 
the formula reps would have their attention and they would talk about the latest changes in their formulas. There was organic and non-organic. There was cow's milk based and there was soy milk based. There was low iron and there was very expensive hypoallergenic formula. They would each say that their formula was the best and they would hand out literature that talked about the newest ingredients that they had added and that would make their formula combination better than their competitors. Then the next month, another competing formula company would come in, bring like a whole Mexican lunch for the staff, and they would do the same thing. They had a captive audience while the staff ate lunch, and they would talk about why their formula was new and improved, and why the competitor's formula that was missing some of the newest ingredients were putting babies at risk for not having these specific vitamins or nutrients added to the formula. I do feel that formula is a food that moms can decide to feed their baby or that moms will use if they need to supplement. But you know what? This kind of talk really pissed me off. One formula company pitted against another formula company, each saying that theirs was the best and each saying that the others were missing vital nutrients, which put babies at risk. The representatives, they knew who I was and they used to follow me around the unit and try and coax me into coming into the lounge and listening to their spiel. And one time when I was just so adamant about not coming in, one of the representatives told me that I really needed to have this information so I could educate the parents. Well, I beg to differ, but this one particular rep got me so pissed off that I finally said to her, so you want me to learn about the new and improved formula and tell moms that they should be using your formula over another one, and I'm just not going to do that. And by the way, now that you've added these latest two ingredients and the formula has all the nutrients babies need, I would like to know, what about last year when you said the same thing, but now your formula didn't have those ingredients, but now that they do, it's okay. But are you saying that all the babies who had that formula last year, that was minus these latest two ingredients, that it harmed the babies, just like your competitors are doing now? Well, you know I got met with silence. She had nothing to say, and I got my point across. And this one particular rep she left me alone from that point on. You know, these are newborn babies we're talking about. They're not experiments. We're not talking about a detergent like Tide. The commercial talks about the new and improved Tide. It works better and takes out stains better than last year's Tide or their competitors. Now that I could deal with. It's just detergent. But don't expect me to push one formula over the other and don't expect me to say that one has all the right ingredients for the babies and the competitors that do not are putting babies at risk. I have lots more to say on this subject and we will get to it in one of the next few episodes. In a previous show, I told you about one of my favorite books by Gabrielle Palmer. She wrote The Politics of Breastfeeding, When Breasts Are Bad for Business. Now, I just love the book but I also really love the title. She delves deep into how the formula industry has evolved. I am going to pull out some sections that I think will give you a good overview of what was happening in our culture during this time period. And yet, it is a far cry from the in-depth reading that can be available to you if you read her book. I'm excited to talk about this subject because there are so many questions about how formula came to be sold as the best food for baby, when clearly for centuries, people recognized that human milk was exactly what our babies needed, and without it, they did not fare well, and the infant mortality rate was very high. So why on earth would we take away the best thing ever and replace it with substandard food? Let's dive into Gabrielle's book so we can learn more on this subject. 
I am going to quote the beginning of one paragraph as she says it's so much better than I ever could. And it goes like this. A market for artificial milk and infant feeding products was created in the late 19th and 20th centuries. It was conceived through the mutual attraction of manufacturers and doctors. This love affair developed into an enduring and stable marriage, which has lasted to this day. Now, several factors contributed to the change from breast to artificial feeding. The United States was industrializing and urbanizing rapidly. Any shortfall in workforce numbers could be quickly made up by immigration. Poor Europeans flooded in with little choice but to accept the conditions and ages of the host country, which were not much better than in Europe. The majority of rural women continued to breastfeed, but increasingly urban workers were forced to be separated from their babies and sought replacement feeds. Though wet nursing was still in practice, doctors found that they could make money by inventing and promoting substitutes of milk And, of course, their clients were that wealthier woman prepared to pay them for this breast milk substitute. These women could reject breastfeeding for all the usual reasons, just as we learned they had done centuries before. And instead of hiring a wet nurse this time, they could just pay their doctors for a custom-made food for their babies, believing that this was the modern state of art concoction and it was a scientific wonder. The term infant formula was a stroke of marketing genius. It made a recipe based on ordinary old cow's milk seem like something special. At the same time, commercial infant milk spread through the market and poor women who could really not afford doctor's fees bought them. By 1922, 58% of United States babies were still breastfed at 12 months, though the urban rate was lower than the rural. This seems to be a good place to end the show today, and we will pick back up next Wednesday and really get into this subject even deeper and talk about how formula has evolved over the years and how it was marketed to the masses and how this resulted in the continued decline of mothers breastfeeding their babies. If you have enjoyed this series and want to learn more, you will want to read Gabrielle Palmer's book, The Politics of Breastfeeding. You can send me an email and let me know what you think of this topic. And if you read her book, I would really like for you to share your thoughts. If you have not joined our Facebook group, just head on over to Facebook, Do a search for All About Breastfeeding Community and join us. I would love to hear what you and others have to say on this subject of infant feeding and how it has evolved over the centuries. Until then, bye-bye. Have you heard that Phoenix, Arizona is blessed with an amazing birthing center? Baby Moon Inn Birth Center is the best option for families who want access to midwifery care in and out of a hospital setting. You can experience birth in a comfortable home-like setting where natural birth is the focus. Laboring in water, being able to walk outside during labor and enjoy the beautiful garden. This is what birth can be like for you. There is so much more to learn about Baby Moon. The staff would love to have the opportunity to meet you and would like to extend an invitation for you to attend a free Choices in Childbirth class and a tour of the birth center. All you need to do is call 602-314-7755. That's 602-314-7755 and ask for the tour dates. You can also go to allaboutbreastfeeding.biz forward slash podcast and on the right hand side of the page you will see a link that will bring you to the calendar and you can sign up for the tour yourself. When you come in for the tour make sure that you tell them you found out about it from the All About Breastfeeding podcast and you will be given a very lovely free gift.